welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Well, we're going to get into the word of the Lord today, like I said. And you know what? You didn't come to church today to hear from me. Oh, thank God, because I don't have anything to say. It's about us coming together and hearing from the Holy Spirit. Never go to a church to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown. This is not about hearing from a man or hearing what men have to say, the ideas and philosophies. No, this is about us coming together and hearing from the Holy Spirit. So let's do this. Let's honor the Lord. I'm going to ask you to stand back to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer today as we approach the Word of God. Father, today we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for what you've already done in this church service. How good it is, Lord, to be in your presence How awesome, wonderful it is to be in your house, God. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere, God. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than be anywhere else, Lord. And thank you, Father, for the privilege and the honor of your presence today, God, that when two or more are gathered, there you are in our midst. And so, Lord, we thank you for being here, God, and showing up and doing your thing, God. We want to get on board with you and what you're doing. Lord, as we open your word and we approach your word, we pray, God, that you would open us up to receive it. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, open our hearts to understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the motivation, the encouragement, the strength that we need for each and every one of our individual lives. How wise you are, God, that you can speak a now word to each and every individual in this place, God. Lord, we, we just give you praise and glory for that. Father, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves, but also we would ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. We bless them, Lord. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. Lord, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say Amen. 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 You may have a seat. Today, get your Bibles out and go with me to the book of Hebrews. Once again, Hebrews, the fifth chapter. We're continuing our study in the book of Hebrews, and we've been talking about prayer the last couple of times we've been together in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number five. Hebrews chapter number five, and we got to verse number seven, and and we've camped out at verse number seven talking about prayer. If you remember a couple of times ago that we were together, Pastor Jim ministered a message about the asking prayer and how even though God knows the things that we have need of before we ask, that we still have to ask. And I know in my own personal life, I was motivated to pray and to ask God, and we've got a great big God, and so we can ask great big prayers, and God responds, God answers. Also, uh, last week when we were together, Pastor Luke knocked it out of the park with a great message about genuine prayers, and how this is not about a tradition, this is not about a ceremony or a ritual, this is about us getting into that secret place and getting real and raw with God and, and just connecting with God in our prayer times. Today, let's read Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 7, and then I'm going to tell you where we're going to today in our series on prayer. It says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 7, these words. Speaking of Jesus, it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. Today, I want to talk to you about prayers from ordinary people. Prayers from ordinary people. See, you and I, ordinary people. We put on our pants every day, go to work, eat food, you know, boring, mundane, ordinary people, you and I. And yet, here we approach the Word of God, and it says, Jesus, Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 7, who in the days of his flesh. Now, I wouldn't argue with you that Jesus was no ordinary man. I mean, think about it. The virgin birth, the miraculous followed him around everywhere he went. He had the divine nature on the inside. He lived the perfect, spotless, sinless life. This was no ordinary man. And yet we find when we approach Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse number seven, it points out that Jesus in his prayer times, who in the days of his flesh. See, Jesus robed himself in humanity. Jesus came in the natural, in the physical as an ordinary man. Jesus came and robed himself in flesh. He was so committed to the human experience that he subjected himself and submitted himself to weakness. Robed himself in a man's body and lived among us. Yes, he was the God-man, but he still had to do some things. He still had to pray. And when we see the prayer life of Jesus, it should encourage us to pray. I mean, think about it. Jesus prayed 
publicly. There were times where Jesus was hanging out and talking to people and doing different things, and all of a sudden, he would lift his eyes to heaven, and he would start to pray, give thanksgiving to God, uh, say different things to God, and God would respond at times. Wow, amazing. There were times that Jesus would pray privately. Here, Jesus would go up to the mountainside all night to pray. Oftentimes, you'll see before something major happens in Jesus' life, a major decision, a major miracle, or a major breakthrough, or, or something that was, was just central to the story of his life and what was about to take place, he would go off to pray. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, here he is, he's praying. He's praying so passionately and fervently that his sweat is coming out like drops of blood. And I mean, Jesus, here he is, he's about to choose the 12 disciples who are going to be with him. And what does he do? He goes up to the mountainside to pray. He's about to walk on water, right? He sends his disciples ahead of him. He goes up to the mountain to pray. See, Jesus was always in prayer. You know, it's interesting to me that the disciples, as they were looking at the life of Jesus, they never asked Jesus, hey, how do we cast a devil out? You know, uh, they asked, why couldn't we cast the devil out? But they never really asked him, how do we cast the devil out? The disciples never asked him, how, how do you do those miracles, Jesus? Tell, tell us how to heal. Tell us how to, how to, you know, turn the water into wine. Glory to God. I mean, like, what, what, what is that all about? They never asked him about that stuff. No, they were so impressed by one thing in the life of Jesus that the Bible records that they came to Jesus and they asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray. Why? Because when they looked at the life of Jesus, they saw the prayer life of Jesus and they saw that when Jesus prayed, Jesus got results. And if you and I want to have the prayer life like Jesus does and get the results that Jesus did, we're going to have to learn some things. And I believe today as we go along, we're going to find out some things. Now, this prayer life of Jesus not only speaks to us of the greater emphasis that we should have on prayer, that if Jesus had to pray, this is the God-man, and if Jesus had to pray, how much more should we be in prayer? I mean, that right there is enough for me to say, hey, let's shut this thing down and let's all go to our prayer closet right now. And yet, something else it should speak to us, it should also show us that our prayers can and will be heard as we pray the will of God in faith with a godly fear. Let's take a look at the verse again, Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 7, take a look at it, who in the days of his flesh, Jesus as an ordinary man in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because he was God? No, because... He had a special supernatural ability in prayer? No. Why? Because of his godly fear. He was heard because of his godly fear. So we can see in the prayer life of Jesus that Jesus had a priority. He had a priority in his life. He, he went aside and took time aside to pray. Who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and suppl supplications. There's the priority. But it also records that Jesus had a passion what was his passion? With vehement cries and tears. See, this wasn't a religious experience for Jesus. This wasn't just a list of, uh, of things that he would read off every day. It wasn't a dead existence with God. No, he was vehement. He was passionate. He, he would even cry, tears streaming down his face as he went before the Father. And then finally, we see the place that he comes from, which is a place of godly fear. So what does that mean to you and I? That means that if we're going to learn from the life of Jesus, that our prayer life should have a priority and passion from a place of godly fear. I'm going to put that statement up on the overhead for you. Our prayer life should have a priority and a passion from a place of godly fear. Let's read that all together, okay? On the count of three, here we go. One, two, three. Our prayer life should have a priority and a passion from a place of godly fear. Okay, let's read it again. Everybody this time, you didn't come to church to spectate. You came to participate. So we're all going to get involved now. Come play. Okay, here we go. On the count of three. One, two, three. Our prayer life should have a priority and passion from a place of godly fear. See, if we're going to learn anything from the prayer life of Jesus, we're going to learn that here was Jesus, robed in flesh, an ordinary man. In fact, the Bible records that if we would have passed Jesus on the street in his day, we would not have looked at him, we would not have been drawn to him because he looked like everybody else. He was a Jew, he was a man, he was walking around, and there was nothing so handsome about him or, or you know, he wasn't so muscular, no build, no, nothing like that. He would have been average height, average weight, average build, average face, all that. And, and there was nothing that would have drawn us to him physically. So he was an ordinary man, and he prayed and got results. So if we're going to pray and get results, then our prayer life should have a priority. We've got to set times aside to pray. We've got we to place a priority on this. Make it important in our life. It should have a priority and a passion. It should not be a dead religious prayer like we 
talked about last time we were together. This should be something that comes out of the heart. And finally, it should come from a place of godly fear that we approach God humbly. We approach the king with reverence and that we come to him who is able to save us. Are you listening today? So today I want to talk to you about some ordinary people who prayed in supernatural results. Is that okay? A couple of people we're going to see in the Bible. I had to edit so much. There are so many examples throughout the word of God. So in your own prayer times, in your own times in the word, you can find some more. But I just want to take a look at two ordinary people who prayed in supernatural results. First one I want to take a look at is Elijah. Not Elisha, Elijah. Elijah. You there in Hebrews? Turn with me to the book of James. James chapter number five. Y'all doing okay today? It just got very quiet. I didn't even hear any pages rustling, so I'm just making sure you're all still here. James chapter 5. There, there. Thank you for those godly rustling pages. Hallelujah. James chapter 5. We're going to read verse number 16 through verse number 18. James chapter 5, verse number 16. The context, he's talking about prayer, and look at what he says. James chapter 5, verse number 16. He says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Put a priority on this, guys. He says, come on together and pray for one another. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Next sentence. The effective, fervent prayer. There's the passion. Not the effective, read off a page prayer. Not the effective, uh, traditional prayer. Not the, the prayer that your parents taught you as a baby that you're still repeating. Day. No. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. There's the place that godly fear of a righteous man avails much. In other words, it gets the job done. It works. When you pray with a priority and a passion from a place of godly fear, it avails much. It gets results. It gets the job done. Now, let's take a look at verse number 17. Verse number 17, we get the example. Look at this. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Hold on a second. We were just talking about Jesus. It would be easy for us to write off Jesus and say, well, that's just Jesus. I mean, he had the divine nature. He was the God-man, supernatural birth. He lived the perfect, spotless, sinless life. I can't pray like Jesus prayed. Okay. First of all, yes, you can, because he submitted himself to a fleshly, earthly body. He put a priority on it. He prayed passionately and from a place of godly fear and was heard because of that godly fear. So, yes, we can. But you need another example? Here you go. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. There was no supernatural virgin birth. There was no God nature in him. There was the Spirit of God upon him, yes, but he was still a man with a nature like ours. And what did he do? Look at it. He prayed earnestly. So he put a priority, but he also prayed earnestly, passionately. He prayed earnestly, what? That it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Now, I don't know about you, but if that was me, I would have gone around and said, hey, you know what I did? <laughs> yeah, check this out. I prayed, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. What you got? <laughs> you want me to pray for you? <laughs> don't ask me to pray for you, because when I pray, it gets done, right? That's just me. Verse number 18, look at this. And he prayed again. Uh-oh, watch out. What's going to happen now? And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. My goodness, here's a man with a nature just like ours. Here's a man who prays and things happen. Why? Because he had the divine nature? No, he was a man like us. Ordinary person walking around, but he was about the business of God. He had a priority in his life to pray. And he prayed passionately, fervently, and it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. But he prayed again. And what happened? The earth produced rain, produced its fruit. Let's take a look at this prayer because I believe that we can learn some things from this prayer that Elijah prays. And, and, and I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 Kings, Old Testament 1 Kings. And let's take a look at what happens. 1 Kings chapter number 18. 1 Kings chapter number 18. Now in 1 Kings chapter number 17, we see in verse 1, the first time Elijah shows up, he stands before the king. He says, the God whom I serve, whom I, who, in whom presence I stand, is, is going to cause the, the heavens to close up and there shall not be rain except at my word. Now, he had a word from God. He had the will of God that he had spoken. And yet, the book of James records that even though he had declared that, he had spoken that, he stood in the presence of God, he still had to go pray and make it happen. Are you listening? So here in 
1 Kings chapter number 18. Now let me set the stage for you. Three and a half years, no rain. Elijah shows up, it's time for rain. He's got a word from God. Elijah, I want you to go up and, and present yourself to the king. No more hiding. I want you to go, and I want you to have a showdown. It's going to rain, okay? God tells him it's time for the rain to come. So he has the word of God. He goes before the wicked king. His name is Ahab. Ahab's wife is Jezebel, okay? That's where we get that term, you know, the derogatory name that sometimes people call other people, all right? It was from her because she was so wicked, and so here is Ahab and Jezebel. Elijah presents himself. He says, I want to have a showdown on Mount Carmel. We're going to go up there. We're going to have some sacrifices. Whoever's God answers by fire. He is the one true God. So the prophets of the God of Baal, the little G, little punk, little God Baal, right? They come up, and, and here they are, and they, they have their sacrifice. They have their wood. They have everything in order. And then Elijah has his sacrifice. He has his wood and all that kind of stuff. So, right? so here they are, and he says, uh, listen, I'm going to be a gentleman about this. I want you guys to go first. So here the prophets of Baal start doing their dance, and they start doing their thing, and they start crying out to Baal, and nothing happens. So Elijah starts to play with them a little bit. He says, well, maybe he can't hear you. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's off on vacation. Why don't you cry loud? Come on, come on just you, you got to get into this thing, guys. And so they start hooting and hollering and sweating and spitting. They start cutting themselves right, and they're crying out and jumping up and down, and veins popping out of their neck. This is, this is just my interpretation, by the way, okay? So it, it, you can read it for yourself. And so here they are, and they're doing, they've exhausted themselves, and nothing has happened. He says, okay, okay, guys, guys, you had your chance. You, you had your turn. We've been sitting here all day, and I got places to go, people to see, you know, prophecies to, to declare and that sort of a thing. So let, let's go here. So he gets up. What does he do? He calls on the Lord. The Lord answers by fire. Now, Elijah had told the guys, he said, listen, that's okay, but uh, just so that nobody says, oh, well, you know, I saw the kindling underneath, the little spark happened because it's so dry, and it just lit up on its own. He said, I want you to wet that thing. Now, at this time, water is precious because there's been no rain. So by faith, he says, I want you to wet that thing. I want you to soak that thing. Soak that sacrifice all the way down. Make sure it's drenched. Make sure the wood is drenched. They cut a trough around the edge of it, and, and they filled up, and all the water from the wood and the sacrifice went into the trough around it. And so here it is, completely saturated, completely drenched. He calls on the Lord. The Lord answers by fire. It lights up the sacrifice. It lights up the wood, and it goes and it licks up all the water in the trough, too. My goodness. Now we know who the one true God is. So what does he do? He says, get those prophets of Baal, right? They hack them up and they, they take them out and all that kind of stuff. And now here he is, and he knows that it's time for it to rain. This is where we pick up the story. First Kings chapter number 18, starting in verse number 41. Look at this. Then Elijah said to Ahab, that's the king. He says, go up, eat and drink. For there is the sound of the abundance of rain. Now stop right there for a second. No rain. It's dry. There is not a cloud in the sky. There's, there's no wind. Nothing's blowing in. There, there's nothing. It's dry. It's parched. It's hot. No wind, no nothing. And what does he do? He declares the word of the Lord. He says, go up, eat, and drink. King, you're a king. You, you do your king thing. You go eat and drink. Look at this. For there is the sound of the abundance of rain. Did he have supernatural hearing? Could he hear the rain coming from afar off? No. What, what did he have? He had the word of God. He had a promise from God. It is the time for rain. This is now the time. He had one little promise, and to him, that promise rang so deep on the inside of him that now he could hear the sound of the abundance of rain. Church, when you're, you're sitting in church and, and you're, you're hearing the word of God and all of a sudden that verse jumps off the page and slaps your jaw and, and all of a sudden you realize that God just spoke to me. I, I've been wondering about this. I've been, I've been praying about this. And now all of a sudden you've got a word. That word to you is a blessing and rain is always a blessing. And now you can hear the sound of the abundance of rain. When you're in your prayer times at home and you're studying at home and, and, the, and the, the word starts to speak to you and, and verses start jumping off the page at you and you can't get them off of your mind and you can't get them out of your heart, now what is that? That is the sound of the abundance of rain. Start speaking that faith. Start declaring the promise. Start saying what God says about your life. Why? Because now you have that blessing by faith. It's going to come to pass. 
Okay, so here it is. Your, 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 your finances are draining. They're dwindling. But you got a promise from God that my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. What is that? I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. My kids have gone south, and I don't know what to do with them. Hey, they may wander, but they will come back in their borders. And I have raised them up in the way of the Lord that they shall not depart from them when they grow old. What is that? That is the sound of the abundance of rain. My health may be deteriorating, but by his stripes, I was healed. That's the sound of the abundance of rain. We got to move on. We got to move on. I could camp here all day. Next verse. Next verse. Let's take a look at it. Verse 42. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees. See, there was a priority in his life. And he doesn't just go and offer up, okay, God, make it rain. No, 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 no. Passionately, passionately. Get a picture of this. What does he do? He humbles himself. He, he bows down. It's on the top of a mountain. He stood in the presence of God all this time. Called on the Lord, the Lord answered by fire. But now when it comes time for rain, what does he do? He humbles himself. And he kneels down and he puts his head between his knees. And he starts to pray. Look at the position of respect and honor before God. This great mighty man of God who just called fire out of heaven realizes where the power comes from. And he humbles himself before the presence of God, that place of godly fear. Look at the next verse. Verse 43, and he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So we went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And seven times he said, go again. So get a picture of this. Get a picture of this, okay? Here's Elijah, just had a victory. Now he's praying, asking God for rain. God answered immediately by fire. And yet when it comes time for rain, what does he do? He gets down on his knees, he humbles himself before God, puts his head between his knees, he starts to pray, and he says, go up and look. There's nothing. Go up and look, 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 there's nothing. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? See, oftentimes in our prayer times, we wonder, God, why did you answer this prayer like this and not answer this prayer like this? But God's delays are not God's denials. Just because God has taken some time, there might be something happening in the spiritual that you don't know what's taking place. And God's saying, trust me, child. You've got the answer already. You've got the word already. You hear the sound already. Stay focused in your prayers. Go after it passionately. It's going to happen. So Elijah stays focused. And he won't even go up himself to look. No, he knows that he has what he's asking for. And that's why he keeps sending his servant seven times. And take a look at what happened. Verse number 44, then it came to pass the seventh time. Then he said, there's a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Well, now, wait a second. Wait a second. He's telling the king to beat feet out of there. Why? Because there's going to be so much rain that it's going to stop him from a cloud about the size of a man's hand. See, don't despise the day of small beginnings, church. Sometimes your prayers won't be answered the way that you want them to be answered. But remember, every seed that goes into the ground starts with a little sprout. Something small may happen. Something starts turning. Something starts moving. And when you see it, you start to make preparations. Why? Because even that oak tree, that acorn that goes into the ground may start small, but it's going to grow up so mighty it can move sidewalks. It can tear up, uh, you know, pipes under the ground. It can move houses. Why? Because it's going to grow and it's going to become strong and it's going to produce fruit. See, in our prayer life, don't get discouraged, church. There are people that have prayed for decades and still haven't seen the promises. We've prayed prayers over this church. Our pastors have prayed prayers 30 years ago that they're starting to see the answers to. And listen, we're praying prayers now that I believe we're going to see in the future. We're constantly sowing. We're constantly asking. We're constantly going for it. Don't get discouraged. You may be praying for your family to get saved, and they're all just straight going to hell. But don't get discouraged. Keep praying. Keep praying. It may not even be in your lifetime you, that you see it. But listen, God answers prayer. God is faithful. God will bring it to pass. He who began the good work will be faithful to complete it until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read on. Let's read on. Praise the Lord. Let's read on. Verse 45, now it happened in the meantime. Some of us are caught in the meantime. But look at what's happening. God's working. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was just rain. Pitter-patter? Drizzle? No. What happened? There was heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel, verse 46. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he, you, you know the story. He outran the chariot. See, there was a little cloud as small as a man's hand. When a man's hand delivers a prayer to God, God's hand delivers the man. Are you listening today? Hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, an ordinary man who prayed 
a prayer with a priority. He knew the word of God and he stayed after it. Passionately he prayed. Wouldn't get off of it. Seven times go up again from a place of godly fear. Humbled himself before the Lord. My goodness. Now listen, isn't it interesting that we never are told what words Elijah prayed to get the rain? Think about that for a second. There was no, Lord, I ask you for rain. God, you know that this is a dry and thirsty land, and please send thou thine blessings upon the earth. (laughs) There was none of that. We never are told what he prayed. We are only told how he prayed. Why is that? Because God is not looking for a formula. God is looking for your heart in your prayers. God wants your heart. He doesn't want a formula. He doesn't want a tradition. He doesn't want a ceremony. In fact, the Bible, you know, there's one part where God says, I detest your love feast and and, and all the sacrifice. I, I just hate that stuff. Just come to me with a heart. God loves us so much, and he's invited us into his presence, and he's telling us, I want you to ask. I'm a good God. I'm your dad, and I want to supply for you. I want to take care of you. Just come with your heart, church. Amen. Amen. Ordinary people who prayed in supernatural results. First one was Elijah. Second one is Hannah. Hannah. You're there in 1 Kings. Turn back a couple books to 1 Samuel, chapter number 1. Let's take a look at Hannah who prayed. Ordinary woman that prayed got supernatural results. Let's take a look. Now, as you're turning there to 1 Samuel, chapter 1, let me set the stage for you. In the opening of 1 Samuel, we find a man who has two wives. This man's name is Elkanah. His wife's names are Panina, not Panini like the sandwich. Panina, okay, and Hannah, okay? Now, Panina had children. Hannah had no children. And every year, they would honor the Lord. They would go up, and and they would sacrifice, and they would have a feast before the Lord. And, and, And when Elkanah would sacrifice, he would give a portion to Panina and to her kids, and then he would give a portion to Hannah. But he loved Hannah so much that he would give Hannah a double portion as if she had kids already, Now, there's some faith going on there already. Here's here's the man, and he's given a double portion to his wife whom he loves. Now, Panina didn't like that, okay? She didn't really like Hannah, didn't like the other woman around, you know, didn't really like the fact that here she is getting a double portion, that Elkanah really loves her. And so what does she start to do? She starts to poke and prod at her a little bit. She says, what do you you get? What's that all about? You know, and every year she's she's being mean to her. In fact, the Bible records that she's her rival, starts to use those terms, her rival, and, and, and she's just mean-spirited, and she's hurting Hannah with her words. So much so that Hannah gets so disturbed about the arguments that they have and, and the prodding and the poking and the constant bickering and, and, and the hurtful things that are being said that Hannah just gets sick to her stomach. She didn't even want to eat, and so she goes off on her own and cries. Now, Elkanah, being a man, just like all of us men, goes to her, and he says, What are you crying about? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Just like a man. I can say that because I am one. My wife can testify and shake a hanky at me or whatever. But you know what she does? She says, I'm going to go to God. And so she goes and prays, and this is what we find in 1 Samuel chapter number 1, verse number 11, and we'll read through verse number 19 and pull some things out as we go. Look at this. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, so here she is putting a priority on prayer time. O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant. What is that? That's a passionate cry to God from the place of godly fear. See, she calls herself a maidservant. Doesn't call herself your exalted person. Doesn't bicker and pester God. See, the, the Bible tells us in James chapter 5, verse number 13, the first part of it says, is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Here's Hannah is suffering, and she doesn't go to the Lord and complain. Oh, God, I'm suffering. What are you doing? I don't understand why you've closed my womb. I don't understand why I haven't had kids. Am I cursed? Have I made you angry, God? None of that. No, she humbles herself and puts herself in the position of a maidservant. Let's read on. Look at what it says. Look at what it says. If you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me. Everybody say, remember me. Oh, come on. Not, no, no, no. no. You've got to say it passionately. Say, remember me. remember me. See, because she's crying out to God from pain, crying out to God from her affliction. She is disturbed, so much so that she isn't eating. She's fasting at this point. 
She's saying, I'm not going to touch that food. This should be a celebration, but I've got something on my mind. There's a focus in my life. I want a child. And so, God, if you will look upon me in my affliction and remember me. What does she want God to remember? Look at this and not forget your maidservant. There she is, humbling herself once again. But will give your maidservant a male child. Notice she got specific with God. She didn't say, just give me a kid. She didn't say, give me some children. She didn't say any of that kind of stuff. What did she say? She said, give me a male child. I submit to you, this is just my thoughts, okay? This is not what the Bible says. This is just me right now, okay? Sometimes we wonder what God's doing behind the scenes. We don't understand. Why am I going through this? Why, why is there so much pain? Why is there so much sorrow? Could it be that God needed a prophet in the land? Somebody who would uphold righteousness. Somebody who would walk in integrity. Somebody who would deliver the word of the Lord. Because, you know, the high priest and his sons were corrupt at that time. And so God needed to raise up a prophet, needed to raise up a judge for Israel, needed to raise up somebody who would inaugurate something that would eventually bring in the Messiah, okay? And he needed somebody to birth that. He needed somebody to bring that into the earth. And so here Hannah is. Here Hannah is barren. Here she is going through suffering. And now, finally, out of her affliction and her suffering, she cries out to God and prays the God prayer to get the God result. God, I want a male child. And look at that. Not only that, here's the rest of her vow. Here's what she says. If you will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Wow. Wow. Verse number 12, and it happened as she continued praying. See, we thought she was just making a vow. No, she was praying. As she continued praying, there's the priority, there's the passion. She didn't just stop. She continued praying. Look at that Eli watched her mouth. Now, Eli was the high priest at the time. He was the representative of God on the earth at that time. Verse 13, now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. Now, Picture this for a second. Here she is. She's pouring out her heart to the Lord. She's been crying. She hasn't eaten anything. She's weak, okay? So her eyes are probably puffy and red, and, and she's probably down there before the Lord, and here she is. She's praying to God. She's moving her lips, but there's no words coming out. So it probably looks something like this. And Eli's looking at her like, and he assumes she's drunk. So here the man of God steps in, and let's see what he does. Let's see what he does. So Eli said to her, verse number 14, Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. Steps in, right? Hey, lady, come on. You've been having a feast. You're drunk. Come on, stop it. Now look at the attitude of Hannah's heart. Look at her attitude. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord. Wait a second. She could have stood up and slapped him. What are you talking about? I'm praying, you know. Could have said, who do you think you are? Uh, You're just so arrogant. Just assume that I'm drunk. No. What she? No, my Lord. She humbles herself before the representative of God. No, my Lord. I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Can I, can I translate that in modern San Bernardino terms? She said, you thought I was pouring out the wine, but I was pouring out my heart. That's what she said right there. That's what she said. Verse 16, do not consider your maidservant. There's that humility again four times, four times, twice to God and twice to the representative of God. Your maidservant, do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. Now look at how he responds. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. Now, at this point, I, I believe Hannah had a, what I would consider to be like a Mary moment. You, you know, Mary in the New Testament, after she heard that she was going to be the, the mother of Jesus and was going to have a virgin birth, what did she say? She says, be it unto me according to your word, right? And she received the promise of God at that moment. Here, here Hannah has sort of a Mary moment. Take a look at it, verse number 18. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. Wow. So she received the promise at that moment. Even though she wasn't pregnant yet, she was pregnant. Are you listening? Even though she hadn't been with her husband yet, she knew that there was a male child coming. She knew that there was a promise on its way. She heard the sound of the abundance of rain. She said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went away. And look what she does. She eats. Wow. And her face 
was no longer sad. Why? Because she knew, hey, it's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. God's on my side making a way, like we sang today. Look at this. Look at this. Verse number 19. And then they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. And the Lord, oh, wait a second. Hold on. And the Lord, oh, wait, what? Wait, 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 wait. You just shouted some words out a couple minutes ago. Remember me. And the Lord remembered her. The Lord answered her prayer. The Lord gave her a male child. In fact, if you read on, she didn't just get one male child. She got three male child and two daughters to boot, okay? So here's the barren woman who now has a whole handful of kids, and she's got her little troop behind her, and man, she's happy. My goodness, she's excited. In fact, she, she comes after she weans Samuel. She dedicates him to the Lord there at the temple, and, and, and he just lives there at the temple, and he, he's ministering before the Lord in a linen ephod, the Bible says, even from a young age. And every year she does the mommy thing, you know, she makes him a little robe and brings it and puts it on him, you know, and all right, go minister before the Lord, you know, and, and, and she's just, every year, they're loving on him and encouraged and happy and excited. Now, I wish we had time to get into chapter 2, because chapter 2, she prays another prayer. She's rejoicing, worshiping the Lord. And, and if you got some time this week, I would encourage you, take a moment and get into 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. Read through Hannah's prayer, but let me give you the overall theme. Let me give you the overall uh, story of what it is that she's praying. Basically, if you, if you look at the, the reoccurring themes in, the, in her prayer, it's that it's not about how smart you are, not about how talented you are, not about how much money you have, not about how much strength you have, not about how cool you are or how pretty you are. It's just about your connection with God. That's her prayer. That's her prayer. And so for you and I, we need to take note. Here was an ordinary woman. Here was an ordinary woman who was suffering, who was going through something, having a hard time, having struggles. And yet she prayed and got supernatural results. Brings us back to our main point of what we're saying today is that our prayer life should have a priority and passion from a place of godly fear. You want to get the results Jesus got? You want to get the results Elijah got? You want to get the results Hannah got? Then our prayer life should have a priority and passion from a place of godly fear. Let's say that together one more time. We're on the count of three. One, two, three. Our prayer life should have a priority and passion from a place of godly fear. If you got something from the word of the Lord today, come on, let's give God a great big praise. Hallelujah. Well, you guys have been great today. I really believe you got something from the word of God. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for allowing me to speak that into your life today. And I believe that it's going to produce some good fruit in your life. So let's not stop there. I want to make sure before you guys leave this place that your heart is right with God and that should anything happen to you and you die, that you go to heaven and not hell. Now, sometimes when we mention that word hell, people say, well, uh, Pastor, I don't, I don't really agree with that term. I don't really agree with that place. I don't believe that hell is real, and therefore, I'm going to go to heaven because how could a good God send anyone to hell? Well, let's, let's talk about that for a second. You know, the Bible talks about hell. It's a very real place. Old and New Testament, you'll find it all throughout the Bible. In fact, Jesus speaks about hell. Therefore, it's a very real place, and just by ignoring its existence doesn't make it any less real. That's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. We'll go stand out on the slow lane of the freeway. And you will meet one face to face sooner or later. So just by saying, I don't believe in hell, doesn't mean that you're not going to go there. Hell was never intended for you and I. It was made for the devil and his angels that rebelled. And it's not something that God wants us to go to. God is grieved when people go to hell. We choose it by our lives here on the earth. The Bible says it's appointed for, one, for man once to die and then to the judgment. We're not coming back. We don't get any other chances. This is our opportunity here on the earth right now. God is asking you, where would you end up? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I, I believe that all roads lead to heaven. And you get there your way, I'll get there my way. Everything's cool. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say all roads lead to heaven? Like you, you just do whatever you want and live however you want and then you get to go. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That means it's God's heaven. We got to get there God's way. Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. Can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. Got to get there God's way. Don't you think God, the one who made the plan of redemption, carried out in his son, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross, don't you think that he would tell us how to get to heaven if he wants us there? Well, he does. He tells us how in his word. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's good news because I know how God wants us to get to heaven. It's by being good. 
I've been a really good person my whole life, done a lot of good deeds, helped people out, give money to charities. You know, I bought shoes that give kids in Africa shoes and, you know, dug wells and water and all that kind of stuff and really been a good person. It's great. I'm glad you did those things, but could you just take a moment, show that to me in your Bible where it says that good people get into heaven or be this good and that'll qualify you for heaven? It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say be this good, you get to heaven. No grading scale in the back of the Bible, no curve you have to be above. It doesn't work like that. God is not interested in good works See, because the standard is perfection. No one's perfect except for one. His name is Jesus. So you're not going to get to heaven just by being good. God's not some jolly old St. Nick's in the heavenlies making a list and checking it twice of who's been naughty and who's been nice. Come on, let's listen up. Let's talk for a moment. How, how are you going to get to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Took me to religious classes, Sabbath school, Sunday school, catechism class. Hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Maybe they had you baptized or christened as a child. And you're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven denying hell, right? Wrong. You know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It's not there. Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or christened as a child, or you be born in America, that that'll get you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. And again, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God loves you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Come on, let's love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough today to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. So listen up. Give me a couple more minutes of your attention. Don't let anything distract you right now. God is speaking to you. Some of you might be saying, well, I understand all that, but, you know, not only when I was a child did I go to church, hey, I'm sitting in church right now, and doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? I consider myself to be a Christian. I'm in church. It's great. I'm glad you're here today, but could you, could you just show that to me in the Bible where it says that you just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible says sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. That's like saying I could go to my garage, sit in my garage, call myself a car, and that makes me a car. No matter how much I say it, no matter how long I sit, I will never be a car. I'll just be a crazy person sitting in my garage. You can't get to heaven by sitting in church calling yourself a Christian. Some of you would say, well, okay, I understand that. But you know, my last church I got involved, I helped out, sang in the choir, I carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I, I taught the Bible class, even got a membership card to that church. That's great. Glad you did those things. But just, just show that to me in the Bible, could you? Will you help out? Carry the pastor Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. Teaching the Bible classes, that that gets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere do we see in the Bible God is waiting at the gates of heaven looking for membership cards to a church before you can enter. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, then I love you enough today to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you would say, I, I understand all that, but you know, someone told me that if I knew God, I'd, I'm a Christian. And I know God, I know about Easter and the resurrection, celebrate Christmas every year of my life, sing the songs, about to celebrate right now, got my tree up, ready to go. You know, I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor, Old and New Testament, tell you stories out of the Bible. I know God. That's great, but did you know everybody in America knows God? Everybody in America celebrates the holidays. It doesn't qualify them for heaven. Not everybody in America is going to heaven because of that. You know, if you'd read your Bible, you'd know the Bible says the demons know who Jesus is. They believe he's the son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is, believes he's the Son of God, and can quote scriptures in the Bible, but that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a moment. Look up here. Look up here. It's not about what you have in your head. This is not about some mental ascent towards God having head knowledge about who God is, and that gets you right with God headed for heaven and denying hell, but rather this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. Beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God is looking for a heart. Jesus made this statement to a religious leader of his day who was probably better than all of us in this room, raised in his church, did a lot of good deeds, and he got involved. In fact, he became one of the leaders. He could quote the scripture. He could debate the scripture. He could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? And yet Jesus doesn't pat him on the back and say, good job, man. Keep doing what you're doing, and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. He says, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They raked it through the coals. Listen, this is not about what society says or books or television or movies or any of that stuff. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. 
It's all or nothing with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you. Book of Revelation, the third chapter, Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words for the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say look out? Because think of it for a moment. Only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second. You're going to point at me and count? I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh, you might be. But get over it. Why do I say that? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. So today, come on. You can give God all your heart. You can give God all of your life in a safe and friendly place. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Hey, come on. I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. I'll kind of put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. Even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. But he also said on the opposite side of that statement, if you deny me, I will deny you. Today, your call, your choice. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Or will you sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God? Done my job today. Loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job, sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today, make sure. Who should raise your hand if you've never done this, never given God all of your heart and life? Come on, today, you can do that. Finally, who should raise your hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can get right with God in a safe and friendly church service. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television, in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online, come on, get ready to get your hand up. God is watching. And you can tell an usher right afterwards, come into the church service, or if you're online, you can click the blue button that says respond to God. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. There's two. There's three. Thank you. There's four up on top. Got you. There's four. There's five. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? There's six. Thank you. There's seven. Got you right there. Seven. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Seven up on top. Got you. Eight. Thank you. Right over there. Eight wise people already. Nine, ten. Thank you. Eleven, twelve. Up there, got you guys. Anybody else real quick? There's 12 wise people already. Just give me a little wave. There's a lot of people down here. Thank you, thank you. Got you, 13. Got you, 14 up there in the family room. Thank you, God bless you. 15 up in the family room, two. All right, praise the Lord. 15 wise people already. Anybody else? You need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. And I didn't already see your hand go up. If that's you, just real quick, pop it up, pop it up. Thank you, got you right there. 16, you can put your hand down. 17, no, two hands. Praise the Lord, I'll count you twice. Anybody else? Anybody else? 18, got you right there. Anybody else? 19 up in the family room? All right. Praise the Lord. 18 wise people. Thank you, brother. You can put your hand down. Anybody else real quick? About 18 or 19 wise people. You know you need to do this. If, if you feel God tugging at your heart and you're wondering if you should do this, come on. Come on. Go for it. Go for it. Anybody else? Anybody else? This is the last call. I've got about 18 or 19 wise people. If that's you, just pop your hand up real quick when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick. Real quick. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. All right. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Now listen, you don't get saved just by raising your hand. You've got to pray and invite Jesus to, into your heart. So we want to do that with you, but we can't do that till we get a hold of you, okay? So in a moment, we're all going to stand. We're going to give a clap. They're going to sing a song as we do that. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, it's not too late. Get a hold of your stuff, coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. If you're sitting next to somebody that raised their hand, say, come on, friend, I'll go with you. All right? And, and, and then we'll get you down here. We'll pray with you. You're going to join the family of God and give God all your heart and all your life. Okay, so let's stand to our feet and let's welcome them as they come. If you raise your hand, you should raise your hand. You come right now. Just get your stuff, get a friend, get in the aisle and meet me up front. Just come on, come on, come on, come on. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Give my hand as they come. Just you can come too. You 
They're still coming for the family rooms. You can bring your kids to the foyer. Come on in. Anybody else if you need to come, come on down. Come on down. Anybody else you need to come? Come on, come on, come on. Real quick. They're still coming from the family room. You can come too. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. All right, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Okay, as they come, you guys can just come right on up here. Anybody else that needs to come, they're still coming, all right? So just listen to the instruction as you come. All right, hey, everybody, first thing. First thing I want you to do, put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, okay? You can be happy about this, all right? Now, listen, I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. We look right over here to my right, your left, the guy in the black shirt. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder if they're weird. I'm about the weirdest one in the room, okay? He's cool, real simple, real easy. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart going to give you some free stuff, free information and literature that our pastor wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then he's going to introduce you to a friend we have in the church that we call a spiritual personal trainer. He'll describe what that means and how that works. But listen, I want to make a promise to you guys. Give us a year here at The Rock. One year of your life sitting under the word here in church services. Be consistent. Be committed. Okay? And then for the rest of your life, and looking back on this year, you'll say, wow, I never knew that I could be this blessed. You say, but wait a second, I got my own church. Well, what are you doing here today? And if you died at your own church, would you have gone to hell in the condition you were in? You got saved here at this church. You responded here in this church. You heard the voice of God at this church. We're putting in our application to be your church. We promise to love you, promise to give the word of God to you, uncompromised, and just continue to build your relationship with God. Okay? Give us a year. Watch what God does in your life. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right this way. Just give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.